Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this evening's guest moderator, Elvis Mitchell, and tonight's guests, Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen. Good evening, fellas. How are you? Good. How are you? This film was shot on film, and we were just talking a little bit backstage about that, but there's a look that film has that digital can't quite replicate, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, there were a number of reasons we shot it on film. I, what, one was just a practical reason, which was we were shooting for the first time with Bruno Del Benel. We'd done a short movie with him, but we'd never done a feature with him. So, What was the short? It, it was uh, 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 part of a compilation movie called Paris Je Tem that was, yeah. Um, that's how we met Bruno. But uh, since Bruno, at that point where we had, were starting the movie, ha had also never done anything, shot anything digitally, and we hadn't, and we hadn't worked with him on a feature before, it was another level of complication, which we sort of, wor none of us were eager to sort of take on at that point, because it was, we were all familiar with the process in terms of film, but not so much digitally. So there was that reason. But there was also, to a certain extent, it was just a, temperamental preference to, for this movie, a sort of aesthetic preference maybe to shoot it on film. He, you know, he's funny because Bruno shoots on film, but he is a very heavy, uh, what would you say? Um, Digital manipulator, uh, you yes. know, after the fact. Uh, he works on it quite a bit in the DI, the digital intermediate in terms of color. Because I was wondering how you got that look, because I was almost reminded a little bit of Oh Brother, which you guys did a lot of work on the, the, the DI, too, did you not? Yeah, well, that's true. It's probably, of the movies that we've done, it's probably the most drastically sort of altered in the DI. Oh Brother was actually the first movie to use a DI. Um, but we probably went f further on this than any other movie that we've done since Oh Brother. That's true. So, I just met John Goodman last week, and he described his character as a gas bag, um, basically sort of the Charles Portis character. Um, was that kind of sculpted for him in the writing? Yeah, actually, mm, half. Midway through writing it, we kind of realized, well, this is something John would do, because it turns out that this guy he's taking a road trip with uh, is indeed a gas bag and kind of the classic Charles Portis, you know, getting on in years gas bag. Uh, and we knew John would uh, understand that. So midway through the writing process, it, came, it became, as you say, sculpted for John. Let's talk about the other casting, though, how you end up picking the other actors. Um, well, it's sort of different with each of them. I, mean, well, I guess all the other actors besides John were, and Murray, right, were actors that we just met in auditions, right? So we, they were, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the difficult part, the, real, the part that we weren't sure was even castable, frankly, was the part that Oscar plays. Because it was, you know, it, it, we needed an actor who would, you know, be right for the part and was a great actor and could carry a movie and was every scene of the movie. But also, the movie is about a musician and um, you know, he performs a number of songs in the movie, five or six songs, pretty much in their entirety in the movie, and has to convince the audience that he is a musician. And so the combination of those kind of musical chops and someone who was right for the part as an actor weren't necessarily... I mean, there was... We thought at one point it's possible this person doesn't exist. No, I'm not, that's not hyperbole. It was, it's, we thought, you know, it's, it's, there aren't many actors. There are a lot of actors who, if you ask them, can they play, will tell you, yes, they can play. But there aren't a lot of actors who can play and, uh, and with, the sort of, with the skill and uh, with the ability to sort of learn a repertoire and a style of playing um, so quickly. Um, as this, as Oscar was. It's a very distinctive kind of guitar playing. It kind of basically almost no, nobody really does anymore. Uh, you know, there are actually a lot of guitar geeks out there who, 
Um, yeah, but it's certainly well, not a po- don't, don't not play a popular and sing form. Like that, do they? I mean, people may play, but they don't play and sing like that. I mean, it's uh, yeah, and it's a particular thing. Yes, I won't argue with you there, sir. <laughs> because I just found myself thinking, this is when the first time you guys have a loser who's actually really quite capable. I mean, generally the guys are losers who they're losers for a reason, but. He, and that's an unusual thing, it feels like to me, to have somebody who is talented, but just isn't at the center of the target. Right, right. That was kind of the, the interesting issue for us. It's kind of, it's a movie about this character. It's, it's just, you know, it's a character thing. And it, it, it was interesting to us to investigate somebody who's, like you say, good at what he does, but not successful. It's not as interesting. I, where do you get started in terms of writing a story about a character who's bad at what he does and not successful? That doesn't pose a lot of questions. He's bad because he's, you know, he's not successful because he's not very good at what he does. But you know, we want to do something about a musician that, su- also such that it would be pleasurable to, you know, watch the guy perform in the movie. The 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 main character performs songs at length, and we needed somebody who was. Yeah, this is part of the casting challenge, compelling as a musician, not just good as a musician, somebody you'd actually want to watch, and somebody who, by virtue of that, would pose that question. If he's kind of good at what he does, why, is he, uh, why isn't he getting further? I find myself thinking, too, in looking at it, it looks, the movie has a look of a lot of old album covers, even from the 60s. Yeah, well, very self-consciously, we talked with Bruno Delbin, uh, with Bruno, the DP, about the, the cover of... Free Wheel and Bob Dylan, um, which is kind of that, it's, uh, again, in terms of how Bruno lit it and especially how he manipulated it after the fact, it's very much that feeling of desaturated colors, kind of the ectochrome period look. And also, <clears throat> also partly the weather, you know, no direct sunlight, it's all gray, slushy, wintry New York. I mean, that... Right, that album cover specifically was kind of a visual touchstone for how the certainly how the exteriors would look. And how did you guys end up picking the songs for this, or, or putting the, the songs together, rather? Um, well, it's sort of a mixed bag. Some some of the songs that are in the movie, we are in the script. We sort of were thinking about them when we wrote it. Some of them were songs that. Um, came from T-Bone and some of them were I guess you know just a disc same way we worked with T-Bone in the past where we you know set we he for instance the first person to get the script when we were done with it we started talking about the music in the movie um, we told him what we were thinking about musically or he was able to see I mean what we were thinking about musically because as I say some of the songs were written to the script and then it's sort of a discussion of what works at what place in the movie. So it's really, t- a lot of it's T-bone after that. Well, let's take a look. We have a scene, a clip here, which you can see John Goodman at his most Charles Portis-esque, I guess. Can we put that clip up now? Uh, there are actually words there in those little, they, they, I, I think there were some excised swearing in there, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I guess what I found myself thinking, too, if this is one of the scripts that you guys just sat down and finished, because I know you told me in the past you have these pieces, you'll start, and then you go away and come back to them. Was this, which was this? Kind of, you know, Joel uh, suggested this. Uh, he, we were sitting around the office, and he said many years ago, he said, all right, how about a movie starts with Dave Van Ronk being beat up outside the gaslight in, uh, or Gertie's Folk City, I think he said in uh, 1961, uh, is that a movie, where does that go? And we kind of thought about that, but did not uh, did set the idea aside for a number of years and then just sat down and actually wrote the script. Well, before we made, after we made True Grit, and the, yeah. But once we, yeah, we, so it was sort of an idea that was kicking around for a while. Once we started writing it, it was actually a pretty fast process, whereas some, some things we do stretch out over long periods of time. This was pretty fast once we got into it. And was there, I mean, did you end up finding, did you use a Dave Van Ronk book at all? That's kind of an interesting Yeah, book. a little bit. Um, uh, we actually gave Oscar, the character has Dave Van Ronk's repertoire, <clears throat> mostly in terms of the songs he sings. Um, uh, probably most people don't know, Dave Van Ronk is kind of a folk singer of the, kind of the biggest folk singer on the scene before Bob Dylan showed up. 
Um, uh, yeah, we used his book. He wrote a memoir, which is actually pretty funny and it kind of a great document of the period. You read it. Yeah, it's kind of great, right? Um, and we kind of pilfered things from it. You would, Oscar's character is not Dave Van Rock, but we did steal very specific things. Well, you know, we were interested in, he, he was, Van Rock was this sort of working class kid from Queens who came to, you know, and there were a number of kids like that, kids from the boroughs who come in and were playing folk music in the late 50s and early 60s. Van Rock was also a, in the Merchant Marine um, which this character is. Um, so it was sort of his repertoire of certain things about his background that we took and then kind of felt free to invent a character beyond that. Who, The idea really was the movie was made up characters but real music from the period. Did you ever think about making it more sticking closer to a book? Because I mean, the thing that Von, Van Rock really has is that he's kind of aware of what's going on and kind of aware of what kind of guy he was. And... Oscar's character kind of lacks that. Well, that's true. He was much more self-aware than this character, and he had a perspective on the music and and uh, and the scene. I think, in a way, you're right that uh, this character does it. But he also no. has a yeah, and a very acid sense of humor. Actually, it occurred to us long after we'd shot the movie that, in some respects, John Goodman's character is more like Van Rock than <laughs> than Oscar. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because the book is almost this kind of stream of consciousness, sort of like yeah. railing about himself and the yeah. scene. It's, it's very funny. Yeah. yeah, like Charles Portis' characters, he's like a, a well-traveled person who rants about things, yeah. Yeah, and, and sort of, I mean, <laughs> what's so funny, too, is he's, he's actually a really good music critic <laughs> in the yeah. book, too. I mean, he's very smart about that stuff. Yeah. And very, as John Goodman's character is in, in, this, in the movie, he's actually very dismissive of folk music. Oh my God, yes, all the cliches. I mean, he just sort of takes them on all one at a time, really. Yeah, yeah well, that's true that Van Rock was very sophisticated musically. And, you know, he was actually originally a jazz musician. Um, and, uh, and, and it was almost opportunistic, the whole connection with folk music, because when he was a kid, he could make more money in the basket houses in the village playing folk music than he could playing traditional jazz, which is what he originally. Uh, was into. Um, but he also, you know, I mean, if you look also, even if you look at his his sort of discography, if you look at the records that he did, they're, they're fairly eclectic musically also. And he had a lot of different interests and he had, he had very far-ranging interests beyond music. So he was a pretty, you know, this movie is not about him, <laughs> <laughs> but it, he was an interesting guy. I mean, the question you guys must get all the time, I have to ask you this, um, so many of your movies are set in the past, um, more than half of them, as a matter of fact. What is it about? But they're all very anti-nostalgic looks at the past. Yeah, yeah, yes to both. I agree. Yes. Why is that? I don't know. Uh, the past is more interesting. I don't know. We, uh, just in terms of telling a story, uh, who needs? You know, you walk walk out the door and you're in contemporary New York. So who needs us for that? Well, it's also, you know, it's, there's an exoticism to it, even if you're, you're not, even if it's not uh, romanticized or sentimental, as it's, you know, it's a, it's a once upon a time thing um, that's interesting. And also, that's just we're, as a setting, you know, the setting has some, I don't know, even know how to describe it, some emotional charge. Like, you look at a cover of Free Wheeling and it says something to you, you know, and that, you know. You can use that. You can harness that, whatever power that has, which is really hard to verbalize, but it has some kind of power. There's, there's one other thing about it, actually, which is another reason it occurs to me, and especially you were just mentioning before the, how the movie sort of looks like album covers from the period. Um, one of the things you get to do when you do a period movie is create a world um, for the camera. You have to create it in sort of globally and in every sort of little detail, which is actually a lot of fun. I mean, one of the fun things that we did in relation to, in connection with this movie is there are album covers you see in the movie. And doing research about those and looking at a lot of them and trying to imagine taking, internalizing those sort of design ideas in that 
and just the spirit of those things and making them yourself. It's fun. I mean, it's part of the pleasure of making movies is doing that sort of thing. And when it's a period movie, it's a different kind of pleasure than specific to that than if you're doing a contemporary film. And it's just somehow, I don't know, it's a different way of saying the same thing. It's immediately transporting. You're going somewhere. I just found myself wondering, too, a little bit, because a lot of the music that grew out of this was the music you guys use in A Serious Man, and I wonder if that was a little bit of a spur for you, too, because that sort of folk rock of the mid to later 60s that yeah, that's takes true. place. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. And rock and roll and, and kind of, you know, Bob Dylan, for that matter, came out of, yeah, came out of this scene. Yeah. But it's all, you know, uh, it's all part of a sort of chain, you know, a river of music that we're interested in, which is American music, the sort of same ca music that was in Oh Brother um, was the music that was interesting to these people who were reviving it, these kids who were reviving it in the early 60s, um, and that then became, yeah, rock and roll, so, which is the music we grew up with. Yeah, because I just wondered if that was part of it, because I just found myself thinking about the Jefferson Airplane song you guys use in A Serious Man, which very much grows out of the musicianship we hear in this period, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's kind of a whole, yeah, it's, it, right. It's a recreation in, in reverse of, you know, The Serious Man took place in the mid-60s in a suburban Midwestern Jewish community, and it's kind of, it's where we're from, and that is the kind of music we listen to. And, you know... Right, that it's all stuff that has power, and if you're interested in that kind of music, you're, you get interested in chasing it back to where it came from, which is successively going backwards, the music in this movie and then the music in Oh Brother. And again, it all has, you know, power to transport. Yeah, I mean, there's something almost fable-like even about all those songs. I mean, the kind of things that you know at a certain point, the kind of things you play for kids, because they do feel like stories in that way, don't they? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, folk music is that, yes, absolutely. Well, let's actually, can you pull the clip the, with Oscar? Because I want to actually play that clip with, uh, with Oscar. Because that's a, a... Oh, he's doing, a, he's, he'll be playing a, a song that's really associated with Dave Van Rock. It's Green Rock, he wrote. That's going to see, that must be really obscure. If you haven't seen the movie, Oscar Isaac has this nightmarish cross-country road trip with John Goodman and Garrett Hedlund. John Goodman is an old jazz cat who you can't shut him up except whenever they pass a service station, John goes to the men's room and shoots up and comes back to the car and passes out. Uh, well, how did you guys end up oh, picking that song? Was that in the original screenplay or how did that one come about? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think it was in the original screenplay, but it, as Ethan was saying, it's a song that's um, very much associated, or he didn't, you know, with Dave Van Rock. Um, I wonder if that was like a first choice for you, because it's, it's the first thing I thought as I was watching it. It fit into that Dave Van Rock kind of uh, feel of the, of yeah, the, the story. Yeah, and also it just seemed right for that, you know, that's actually, I think, pretty much all, a little, little bit more of it, all we hear of that song song in the movie. It's, and it's kind of like a, I don't know, sort of a back porch kind of folk song that seemed right for him to be just sort of noodling in the car. I mean, you know, the, a lot of the, these choices were what makes sense in terms of the period and the sort of the feeling of the thing and, the, and, 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 and what the song's about for its place in the story. So. I guess we have time now for audience questions. I have a mic right here. I was wondering if you could talk about your creative process and what lets you replicate it so many times in different movies. It doesn't fizzle out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let you take that one. I don't know, you know. Thank you. Okay, then. Yeah, no, it's very nice. Do yeah. we record all that? Yeah, so I want to make sure yeah. nobody loses any I, you know, wisdom. I'll tell you, part of the way that you kind of get yourself revved up, you want to you spend a year working on a movie, you've got to be enthusiastic, at least when you start out. You're certainly not enthusiastic by the time you're finished with it. Um, but, you know, part of what gets you jazzed about it is, uh, you, uh, is a particular, uh, particulars of the story itself. In the case of this one, obviously, it was the music had a great deal to do with it. Uh, you know, you get excited about 
I don't know. You start telling a new story, and it 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 it, it you get a, it fizzes some enthusiasm somewhere deep inside, and you know. You try to do a different kind of story because you want to replicate the fizz, but you know you can't do it by doing the same thing again. So I. Well, you know we're really lucky because we uh, we operated a fairly you know niche kind of place in the business, and our movies are pretty inexpensive to make and we've been lucky in other respects so that we get to pretty much do what we want to do as long as we keep the price down without being um, having being subject to the wishes of a committee which is how a lot of movies in Hollywood get made and probably you know committees probably aren't a great thing for m most of those you know most creative process is not great to have a huge committee sort of. So we have the advantage of either being able to, you know, when they work, they're, you know, that's good, that's us. When they don't work, that's our fault too. But there's no sort of third person to, or, or big monolithic organization that's sort of twisting us one way or then another to do things. And I think that's helpful. But uh, before we get to the next question, I mean, you had in the last, in this century, I should say, a couple of really big successes between No Brother and True Grit, and does that end up putting pressure on you to some extent because people look, well, what are these guys going to do next? And I'm sure you weren't advertently swinging for the fences, but those are pretty big movies. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, fortunately for us, yes. Uh, but no, I don't know, the commercial fate of a movie, you work on it so long, it's such a, uh, you work on it so long, when it's done, you're kind of actually thankful to be able to quit thinking about it and then it goes out and does what it does which seems in a weird way unconnected to the movie itself it's just a I, yeah I yeah no so that doesn't so it just finds its audience all your films have so much to do about music when can we expect a Coen Brothers album is it gonna ever happen why you mean music from different movies from no from from you guys do you, do you oh, play music no, no we don't sadly what, what, is, what is your affinity towards music? Like, where does it come from? Mm. Well, That's a weird question. Why, why do you like music? music well, I really. mean, I guess, did you grow up in a musical household? Or? Actually, not really, no. Uh, no. We grew up, it's funny because there was so little music played by our parents that when I went to college, I took the stereo system and they didn't notice it was gone. <laughs> um, yeah, they really didn't play a lot. They played... You know, it was musicals, and they did, but not a lot of, yeah. But like all kids, you know, we grew up in the 60s, and if you, we were just teenagers and kids in the 60s were listening to music all over the place, and, I mean, we weren't any different in that respect. But so I think I think his question is that each of the movies has a very different music personality. Going back to Raising Arizona, I mean, hearing Beethoven played on a banjo, I mean, that's an unusual thing to do. And I, my question following that would be, do you... How do you go about selecting the music that's so, so uh, consonant with the films? I mean, because that feels like it's as much a part of the writing as anything else. Yeah, yeah well, that's a hard so. thing to... Well, you know, it's funny you mention that because that, has a, that was a specific thing with a very specific answer. Um, the, the Beethoven, the Ode to Joy and the Banjo is something we ripped off. The, we had a, when we were kids, we had a record of Pete Seeger and Bill, Big Bill oh. Brunzi. You know the record? Yeah, 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 doing a concert in Chicago. Yep. And Pete played, uh, as part of his act, I think, Ode to Joy and the Banjo. So we thought, oh, okay, that might be interesting in, in the movie. Uh, but, you know, you just kind of grab whatever, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, whatever works. Uh, music is, is, is with story, characters, whatever, you know, whatever serves the cause. And, you know, we've, we've also had, the, again, the really good fortune. We've worked with two people from the very beginning. Well, not T-Bone, almost from the very beginning. Um, we've been work we've known him for about 25 years, but uh, also Carter Burwell, who has been involved in writing music for our movies and working, w working with Carter since the first movie that we made. And, um, you know, that's, it's like, I think part of your answer, part of the answer there is sort of like, why do your movies look so good? Because we work with good DPs. It's also, why is the music so interesting in our movies? Because we work with really good musicians and composers. Uh, that's, that's a big part of it. 
Uh, next question. Hi, um, I don't pay attention to critic stuff that much, but I've been watching your movies for a while. And the thing that really impacts me about them is like your visual imagery and your, a lot of your close shots, like especially like Raising Arizona when the baby was in the middle of the road and the tapping of the foot, it just like stays with me for years. And also um, like when George Clooney was in the elevator of the one movie and the dog bit his hand, like his expression on his face and it just the, the visual imagery is really, it's just really tight. Um, how, how much of that are you, are you thinking about when you write the, write the scripts? And does that process change from a drama to a comedy? Well, a note to the last question. Uh, how much you're thinking about what it's going to look like when you're writing the script, it kind of... Uh, it varies, you know. Do you storyboard a lot? I mean, that's... Uh... Yeah, we still storyboard pretty exhaustively, yes. Yeah. But when we're writing specifically, you know, sometimes the scene is more about how it looks and sometimes the scene is more about two characters sit sitting across from each other, you know, talking. And sometimes some of the things that you're talking about specifically are um, the function of another really great thing about making movies, which is there's a lot you don't know until you actually get on the set and start doing it. And... A lot of stuff is happy accident. A lot of stuff is stuff that, you know, is just sort of taking advantage of opportunities that present themselves in a kind of uh, ad hoc sort of way. And it's, that's one of the really nice things about making movies is you can go in not really having a clear idea about a lot of those things and they happen fortuitously or you come at them through a conversation with other people which you know, some like the actors um, or the DP and you get stuff you're surprised by yourself. And then, of course, sometimes you have a specific idea about how things should look and, you know, the world just won't play ball. For example. Well, that happens, yes, that happens a lot. I mean, for example, the first shot in True Grit where we spent pretty much an entire night, maybe nine or ten hours laying out sort of banks of fog on a road in Texas for an idea we had about how we wanted a, a rider on a horse to sort of appear and reveal this body that was in the street. And, you know, we came close, but the wind kept, wind freshens up a little bit above like four miles an hour and there it goes. And you can, and then you have to think, and then it's starting to get light and you have to think of another way of shooting it. So it's, that happens constantly. That's a very common sort of thing. You come up with a different way of doing You may have this idea that you've planned for three months, and then you get there and realize you have to do something completely different. Hi. Um, I saw Inside Lewin Davis last week at an advanced screening, and I'm going to see it again next week at a, another advanced screening, because I really liked it. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, I was so you're not getting any money from her, is what she's saying. <laughs> and then I'm going to go see it again in theaters. So, yeah. Um, but I noticed while I was watching it that instead of sort of following the traditional three-act structure, the film follows more of a, without giving anything away, more of like a, the structure almost of a folk song. It kind of mimics it with sort of like the way the ver like verses and escalation and themes of repetition. And I thought that... I was really intrigued by that, and I was wondering, did that come organically through the writing of it, or did you set out it, with it, that idea in it's mind? It's funny, because that's been pointed out to us, although it wasn't something we were thinking about, but I guess in a way it's, you could say that that's true. But it, what, what is true is that we had a, we were, it, wasn't, it was an early idea that this, the beginning of the movie would essentially cy cycle around to the end of the movie, that you would be repeating the, the, uh, the beginning. Which is something you guys have done before. It's almost like more parable-like than, than folk song-like. Or like a, th yeah, or like a, a big circle, you know? So that was an early idea. You have time for one more question? You guys are big heroes of mine, first of all, so this is such an honor. Um, I was wondering, you guys are such a good team. How do you guys deal with creative differences? Do you guys like arm wrestle, or how do you figure things out when you're fundamentally against each other on something? Has there ever been a big one, first of all, before that? Uh, you know, it sounds like such a cop-out to say there aren't creative differences, but it's kind of true, there aren't, between us or, 
you know, between other people we work with, Joel mentioned Carter Burwell, that we've worked on every single movie with, there are other people that we've worked on literally all our movies with. We just kind of don't. Uh, differences, I, you know, we try to, if somebody has a problem with something or doesn't quite get or see the other person's point of view, it's an opportunity to explain it or work it out in a way such that you both kind of see it and it's better for that. It's not that we, it's not that we come at things with a well-defined points of view which can conflict because we kind of work out the point of view together. Uh, that might sound terribly Japanese, but it's kind of the reality. Well, there's, there's one other thing about it, which is that, um, just a little bit more specifically, um, you know, people often wondered what it's like on the set. You know, actor, when we were first starting especially, I think actors or other people we'd work with, like, am I gonna say one thing and is Ethan gonna say, you know, what, what's that dynamic gonna be about? But, you know, by the time you get on the set, if we, since we write together, you're so m much in sync I in terms of point of view about details, which are essentially the things that you answer on a set, um, or at least point of view, that, so that the answers about details all come from the same point of view. Um, that there's very little, I mean, literally, sort of whoever is closest to the person asking the question answers the question, and it's, it's not a big deal. But it, what Ethan was saying is true. I mean, the, it's a collaborative, uh, process, and if you do have m major differences with people, you just don't end up working with them again. It's not so much that, y you know, you work with them for, at least I don't think so, that you work with them for 20 years and it's always a screaming match, you know? So. And I guess we're out of time. Thank you guys. Let's thank the Coens for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody, join me in thanking Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen for being here tonight.